Hello everyone, I'm Alex, and uh, today I'd like to show you how I use uh, Lego to creatively explore ideas. Uh, I'm going to try and show you that by uh, making a clock out of Lego, Lego that you can um, explore at home. So uh, day to day I work as a programmer, um, but for the last few years I've been making a lot of musical machines out of Lego Technic. Um, if you're not familiar with Lego Technic, it's just regular Lego, regular bricks, but there are gears and beams and axles. And so you can make all sorts of interesting machines. This one just makes some quite strange sounds. Um, the last piece I made was the video here called Playhouse, and that uses these sort of mechanisms to make electronic music. And in Playhouse, there's an awful lot going on. There's a lot of gears moving and, and, and mechanisms working at once, and people initially seem very drawn to this complexity. But the really interesting thing happens is when uh, people put their headphones on. Uh, they seem to get lost in this really lovely internal space where you can pick apart the, the music and the machine in your own time. And this is why I really like Lego, because a lot of people are you know, used to using Lego, holding it with their hands, making things. It seems to be a really good material uh, to pick apart the making process. So in some sense, if you can really get stuck into one of these machines and pick it apart, you're revisiting the process I went through when I made it. So it can be a phenomenal way to, uh, to share ideas. Making a clock out of, out of Lego is... Um, a great way to learn how they work. Uh, there's centuries of development in working mechanical clocks. And there are lots of weird little inventions you can explore um, that have been made on the way. Uh, a lot of old clocks sort of hide a lot of these details in uh, decoration. And if you're trying to read a, a book on clocks, there's lots of static images, so it can be really hard to sort of figure out what's moving where. Even videos uh, can be hard because there's so much moving at once, you don't know where to look. If you can make it with your hands, you get a really good sense of the forces that are happening in the clock. So what I've done, because we're pressed for time, is I've split the clock into four parts, and I'm going to put them together quickly and explain how they work. And those parts are the pendulum, uh, the pulley, the escapement mechanism, and the dial, or clock face. So let's start with the pendulum. So here's a simple pendulum. It's quite simply a, a thing that swings. And what you've got here is a pivot, a beam, and a weight on the end. And what happens is, when you let go, it wants to fall due to gravity. But because there's a pivot here, it's constraining the motion, so it can't just fall down, it has to fall down and across. And as it does so, it picks up speed. And at the bottom, it's got enough speed to carry on up until gravity stops it, or slows it down, and it comes back and it repeats. Now, the property of pendulums is that if you shorten the beam, they'll run faster. And if I shorten it even further, it runs even faster still. So I can use that property to adjust the speed of my clock. But the problem is here, you can see it's just come to a halt. And the problem is there's friction in the system. The plastic's rubbing together, there's air that's buffeting this. What I need is some kind of energy source that gives it an extra kick to keep it moving. So then we come on to the second part of the clock, the pulley. This is a very simple way to make an energy source out of Lego. You take a weight, you attach a string to it, and you wrap that string around a drum or a pulley. As you lift it up, you're giving the weight potential energy, so naturally it wants to fall down. But because it's wrapped around the drum, it unrolls and generates a turning motion. And we can use that turning motion to um, drive parts of the clock. As you can see here, there are a couple of gears on the back, and all they're doing is increasing the rate of rotation. So uh, if you're not familiar with uh, basic gear stuff, Lego comes with standard gear sizes. So for example, there's a 24 and an 8. So the way you work it out is 24 divided by 8 gives you 3. So for every revolution of the big one, that goes around 3 times. And this is 40 and 8, so this goes around 40 divided by 8, which is 5 times. But the good thing about this is you can start to do maths. So if I combine the 40 and the 8 and the 24 and the 8, I get 5 times 3, or 15 times. So in this clock here, all I'm doing is increasing the amount of rotation that comes out of the end. And quite simply, that means for a very small amount of the weight falling, I get a lot of rotation out, so the clock just runs for a bit longer. So if I fix this on here, the next problem is we need to get that energy somehow into that pendulum to keep it ticking. And to do that becomes the most confusing-looking part of the clock called the escapement. 
Now, it looks a bit weird, but this is another thing that's great to explore with Lego, because when you, see it with your, when you work with it with your hands, you'll see it's actually quite simple. What we've got here is uh, a beam on top that can move up, move up and down, uh, a gear, which has got spike teeth, and this is called the escapement gear, and we've got these little blocks stuck on the pendulum which interact with the beam and the gear. So when it goes over, it lifts up the beam, and when it's also over here, it can't, the, this gear can't move any further. So there are four steps to this motion. What happens is when the pendulum is moving, it comes over to the right. Well, the first step is it can't move because it's being blocked. This, this gear is being blocked. So it's trying to turn this way, and it can't move any further. The second part of the motion is the pendulum comes over and lifts up the beam. And because the, the power is going through this gear, it pushes it through. So the third part of the motion is it can't move any further because now this gear is stuck by this little brick here. So because there's enough power coming through from the weight, it pushes back on that brick and pushes the pendulum back the other way. And the beam comes down because the pendulum's gone back, and now we've gone full cycle. So this is a repeating mechanism. It's much easier to see <laughs> when it's attached to the clock. It'll make a lot more sense. So I let the weight go. Nothing happens. That's because the pendulum isn't moving. As soon as I move it over to the right, if you watch this gear here, you can see it releases the gear. And now it's trying to push back on this here. So it's releasing and pushing, releasing and pushing. And if I let it go, it just ticks on its own. And I always find it amazing that's just happening through gravity. Um, but it's a really fun uh, sort of mechanism to explore these forces. That's pretty much all you need to make to make uh, the working clock mechanism. But of course, if you want to make a working clock itself, you need a dial or a clock face. This is the fourth part of the clock, and it looks a bit sort of confusing. But actually, all it's doing is divisions. It's taking fractions of that rotation. So this dial is going to show seconds and minutes. Now, every second, this is moving one eighth of a revolution. This, this has got eight teeth, so it's moving around one eighth of a revolution. To do 60 ticks in a minute, we need this to move by one sixtieth every second. So we need to divide one eighth to get one over 60. And 60 over eight, that's 7.5. So all these gears in here are doing is dividing by 7.5. We've got eight and 40, that's dividing by five. <laughs> Then we've got 8 and 24, that's dividing again by uh, 3, so that's 15 times 3, total division of 15. And then we increase that by 2, so we multiply by 2, and that gives us 7.5. So now that clock is going to drive the seconds correctly. These gears over the top are just doing more fractions. We've got uh, divide by 5, divide by 3, divide by 2, divide by 2, which is a grand total of 60. So now for every movement of the second hand, the minute hand is going to move 1 60th of that speed. And if I attach it to the clock, you can see it ticking away. Now, each of these parts is really easy to make. Um, so my challenge to you is to, if you've got some Lego at home, give it a go. You can copy this design. Uh, you can uh, cheat by copying things off YouTube. Um, and uh, it's quite fun to explore this, and you'll get a sense of, sort of, of, of how the clock's working. But I'd like to share you, uh, with you some of the creative process I went through or go through in exploring things with Lego. And um, that's that, well, it stopped on its own. But when I want to rewind this clock, I was getting really frustrated that it winds backwards in a really awkward way. It gets stuck, and the, the dials wind back. And it's really fiddly, not very satisfying. The way I have to fix that is disconnect the pulley from the rest of the clock. So I've just pulled out an axle here, and now the whole thing can move on its own. But again, that's really messy, because if I slip, I'm going to drop the weight. So what I really wanted to have was some way to get that back up without me having to interact with it. So my question was, how am I going to solve this problem? What, what mechanisms can I come up with to get into this? And this is where kind of playful exploration is a really great thing. I was working on this for quite a long time, an embarrassingly long time, actually. And um, the first designs were far too complicated. Um, there were lots of motors and electronics and lots of levers, and I only had a limited amount of Lego I could use. I really wanted to keep it as simple as possible. But it was that initial process of exploration and playfully getting into things that really opened up my mind to how I could do things. And I realized that by using differential gears, I could create a mechanism that swung over, connected this to the clock, 
whilst, latching the rest, uh, with, whilst locking the rest of the clock off. So I can plug this in and you'll see it working in, in action. So what happens is I rewind it, the beam pops up, it's locked off the clock, and now it's pulling it up for me. And then to reset it, flick it back, and it goes. But the clock's still not running because the pendulum's not moving. So then I was thinking, right, how can I use that mechanism to get that to do something for me? So again, playing around, you're just putting things together. I realized I could make a little catch that goes behind the pendulum. And because it's a catch, it's only on one side, so it can still swing freely. And because this moves up, I can use that motion to do the pulling. So it's a bit fiddly, but if I slip this in here, connect that to the mechanism. Now when I rewind it, the arm moves over, flick it back, and the clock runs on its own. And it's developing those kind of insights that's really satisfying in the process of invention. You've got an abstract thought in your mind, but with something like Lego, you can physically make it happen and you can test it with your hands. There's a huge satisfaction with having an abstract problem solved in your head, but when you actually make it, it's immensely satisfying. So I thought I'd conclude um, with another little insight I'd like to share, which is a sort of, because I'm a programmer by trade, I love optimizing things. And um, I was determined to optimize this design. There are so many gears around here that I thought I must be able to make this smaller. So again, because I've been playing with it so much and exploring these ideas, I knew I'd be able to make it much smaller. This is going to be a bit of a rush to put together, but I believe this is the smallest working clock made of Lego in the world. That might be a fake claim, I don't know. <laughs> I've used worm gears instead of these gears to really compress this one divided by 60 rotation Another differential to do with all this clockwork at the front, and the escapement is tucked right in here. So super optimized and really fun to work on. It's reluctant to move. But if you want, I can show you this a bit later. So uh, the real thing I wanted to talk about was uh, in developing things in a playful way, you're constantly making connections in your mind. You're developing these tools in your head. Um, and these are all forming up in the background. And the more of these I have, the more creatively you can connect ideas together. And this applies to anything. So whether you like Lego or programming or writing, music, video, whatever you do, playful exploration is a great way to form these connections. And it's not something that's restricted to your childhood. You can carry it on in your life and have sort of wonderful new ideas. And that's it. Thank you. Hello. I want a job where I play with Lego. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you do, you do this for a living. How does something you saw Playhouse at the beginning, if any of you guys want to watch that video, it's pretty amazing, it's on the Wired website. How long does something like that take to build? Quite a long time. The actual um, build of the process is very quick, but it's the development that takes ages because you get lost in this, this development process. And the original design, I built um, a sort of mechanical computer but it kept breaking, so I couldn't use it. But, you know, it's that kind of intentional play that really developed the ideas. Next time. Thanks very much. <laughs> Alex Ormond.